Teenagers of Mid Church, welcome back to Church Unusual for week um, 24793. Feels like that. Um, today we are continuing with our teaching on living a saved life. It's part of the salvation story teaching that we've been doing since January, which feels like a hundred years ago. Um, and today we are going to talk about uh, the fruit of the Spirit that presents itself as kindness. So it's a little portion of the fruit. Remember we spoke about how the fruit that hangs on this tree is multifaceted. It isn't just a, a kindness, a love, a joy fruit. It's all the fruit of the Spirit in one fruit. Um, and you will be displaying this fruit on your tree as you walk around as a, a, a Christ follower, a disciple, a believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit and who displays this fruit in their lives. So let's open in prayer and then I'm going to intro you to today's topic and our story. Lord Heavenly Father, I give thanks for this opportunity and this time to spend with the teenagers um, and Lord, I give thanks for our very special teenagers. And Lord, I pray that in this challenging time um, where we all just want to say, get a grip, we're safe at home, that you would just be with people who are uh, very, very intensely feeling the effects of a lockdown um, and being unable to do what teenagers would normally do. And so we do give thanks for modern technology and for everything that it has provided us with but lord we really so look forward to a time when we will be able to meet one on one on one again one to one face to face and um, where we will be able to just uh, see each other's smiles and share each other's joy and and uh, feel each other's pain but instead of it being through a screen we'll just be able to be in the presence of each other and so lord i pray your hand over the teenagers who have had to learn a whole lot of new things during lockdown um, aside from a whole different way of learning and schooling um, we've all had to had to go through a lot of changes and so I just give thanks that we've been able to do this that we've been uh, blessed as we've been able to do this uh, living safely in our homes with full tummies um, and yes Lord I just pray that uh, as we discuss more about the fruit of the Spirit today, that you would help us to keep practicing and keep putting into real life and action this fruit which you have made available to us. Um, and you know how desperately we need it, um, especially at a time like this. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to this lesson and to this um, message. And I pray that your word would be made clear. Uh, through through what I have on my heart to share today in Jesus name amen so guys yeah today we are talking about kindness and I think um, kindness can uh, be described in a lot of different ways which come out as a lot of different things so for example I just googled a list of synonyms for kindness and it came up with being compassionate and merciful showing benevolence you can google that and affection it is decency it is humanity it is giving selflessly and with no agenda so you know, another one of those another word that popped to mind for me was hospitality um, um, there's lots of ways that kindness shows itself so this word kindness is like a tiny little word for a huge broad aspect of things and um, uh, yeah, so so I suspect that we all show kindness in a whole lot of different ways, and I'm going to challenge you to think of those things, um, because yeah, because we do show kindness um, randomly, you know, like just throughout our day. But um, but today I'm also going to challenge you to be intentional with your kindness. So we are going to look at a story about a guy called Zacchaeus and um, you guys surely will remember Zacchaeus from Sunday school um, and I certainly remember him and it's because of this very cute song that we always sang about Zacchaeus <laughs> Little man was he? He climbed up in a sycamore tree. 
sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. For I'm going to your house today. So the story comes from Luke 19, it's verses 1 to 10, and I'm going to share it with you. It's also printed on your worksheet that I have sent out to you. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was very wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Short person problems. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. So we learn about Zacchaeus that he's a... Let me just get rid of that because I have a whole lot of other papers. And it all gets in the way. So Zacchaeus, we learn, is a chief tax collector. Now, Jericho, where uh, Jesus was heading for and passing through, was on an important commercial tax route. So I suppose it would be like comparing uh, Joburg to a tiny little town in the Karoo that doesn't have a lot of passing traffic. Um, it's a, it was like a commercial center. And that means that tax collection was uh, quite high here. It was a center for tax collection. Um, and I'm going to explain to you a little bit about that so you just understand why he is so hated and why why we have to know that he's a tax collector. Um, and noch al a chief tax collector. So tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. Why? Because they were seen to have sided with Rome. So the Jewish people were under the rule of the Romans who had come into power. And they taxed the people very heavily. So if you were a tax collector in, in Israel somewhere, um, you were a Jewish person, but you were working for Rome, collecting money from poor people who were struggling under taxation. Um, and you had sided with Rome, so you had betrayed your people. And, and how it worked was that um, Rome expected X amount from you. So if you were in a major center like Jericho, Rome would have said, okay, we need, I don't know, 200 rand every time you pass through. That's just a, a, like an example so that we can explain this. So what the tax collector would do was he'd say, okay, I'm going to gather this 200 rand and give it to Rome, but I can actually gather more. So he'd say to the people, I need 300 rand. And then he would make profits off the taxes that he had to pay to Rome. So he would pay Rome what was due to them. And anything extra he could make, he would then make. And so this led to an enormous amount of corruption. And yes, the tax collectors really sucked the Jewish people dry. They, they bled them for as much as they could. And so they were hated and despised, and justifiably so. Um, but as usual with Jesus, we know that uh, he doesn't act in a way that we would expect and um, and he sees a sinful tax collector as an opportunity to share the kingdom with people so here's this very wealthy tax collector um, 
and it's a scandal for Jesus to engage with him. Um, every time Jesus engages with a sinner or someone who's unclean or someone who is uh, perceived to be in the contravention of the, the religious law, the people just go like a little bit ape and have a wobble and they're like, woo, they murmur and, oh, he's going to visit the house of a sinner, blah, blah, blah. So in any case, um, it, this chief tax collector is not very well loved and Jesus decides that he's going to go and visit in his home with him and the people are horrified. Um, and I want you to know that this moment that Jesus engages with Zacchaeus, who has been rejected by his community, um, is a transforming moment. He shows kindness to Zacchaeus because, number one, he engages with someone who nobody else wants to talk to. So he chooses to uh, to be nice to him. It's like it's like you saying, okay, the school bully who everybody hates, I'm going to try and reach out to them. And Jesus does that. It's such a beautiful act of kindness. Um, and it is a kindness that transforms Zacchaeus. He goes from being a sinner um, and and trying to, you know, uh, get as much money as he can. Other people extort them as much as he can. And he, he becomes this uh, this person who just wants to repay everything. He, he repents and he says to Jesus, I'm just going to give back everything that I took from people plus a whole lot more. Um, and that transformative act of kindness on Jesus' behalf brings about such an enormous change in Zacchaeus and this is really what we're going to talk about today because kindness from us can do so much for other people um, so Zacchaeus he repents immediately and he wants to repay and then uh, he wants to tithe as well so he 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 says okay I'm giving half of all of my stuff that's his tithing to the poor and then he says for everything um, that I've taken, I'm going to pay back four times. And that incidentally was in line with an Old Testament uh, Jewish law that said that um, for every sheep that was stolen, four must be repaid. And that's in Exodus. So he's doing exactly according to the law what he would, would have been expected of him. He stole from the people and he's paying back four times. Um, and then Jesus says to him, salvation has come to this house today. And I really also want to talk about that word salvation because it's a huge, deep, meaningful word. And I just pray salvation for all of you, for every person I encounter, for every for every team in my care. Salvation is my biggest prayer because it's not just spiritual salvation. It's a wholeness and a fullness of life. Um, and then Jesus also says to Zacchaeus, you have been restored as a son of Abraham. So, Abraham sorry. so the people had cast him out. They had said, you are not one of us anymore. And we want nothing to do with you. And, um, and through Zacchaeus' repentance and salvation, he is restored to, to his community. Jesus says, you are back in the fold. Um, and then it says in the story that Jesus uh, came for the lost. He came for the lost. This is a very big theme of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, by the way. And if you want more information on that, I'm happy to share because it's one of my, it's one of my true loves, um, is reaching out to the lost. Um, and in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus at a point quotes a scripture, in which is an Old Testament scripture, where he says that he, that he has come to set the captives free. And when he speaks about captives, we understand this to be people who are captive spiritually, physically, um, emotionally, mentally. So if you are held captive to sin, um, to physical acts of sin, like, um, you know, uh, watching pornography, drugs, addiction, um, that sort of thing. If you are spiritually captive, um, then Jesus has come for you too. Jesus has come to seek and save the lost. And that means all of us, really, because um, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So all of us are lost in some sense of the word. Okay, so let's uh, just get a little bit deeper into all of this. Um, so let's talk about this word salvation, um, because Jesus says um, salvation has come to your house today. Now, this act of kindness that Jesus did for Zacchaeus resulted in his salvation 
And salvation comes from the Greek word, and I'm not going to try and pretend I can pronounce it properly. It's sozein, um, S-O-Z-E-I-N, or S-O-Z-O. And it can refer to different types of saving, okay? My coffee's going cold. Blah. So it means that um, you can be delivered from a real threat, you know, like a, a, a danger. You are saved from a danger, like a lion that's running out to eat you. It can also mean that you are physically saved in the sense of illness. So if you're very sick and dying, you can be saved from that. That's another form of salvation. Um, and and it means that when you are when you are saved, when salvation has come to you, there's this idea of wholeness. Um, so salvation is holistic, which is like a, a bit of a fancy word for it deals with all of you. So it's not just you know it's not just about your soul, and it's not just about um, it's, or it's not just about a physical healing. Jesus wanted us to be whole. Um, in John, there's a scripture that says John 10:10 10, 10, that we uh, we Jesus came so that we could live abundantly, we could live life to the full, and we can't live life to the full if there are parts of us that are broken. So this salvation that he brings to the house of Zacchaeus um, is what deals with that brokenness, the parts, all the different parts and the bits that are broken, and it restores us to fullness. And um, you guys will know the story of the woman who was hemorrhaging and she reached out and touched Jesus' coat and she was healed. Now that healing, that word healing, is the same word that is used for the salvation. It's a similar root. And also you will may know the, the story of a man who was demon-possessed and Jesus healed him. He was also saved. And that's the same word as is used for the salvation that came to Zacchaeus' house. So understand this broad idea of salvation. Jesus doesn't just come to fix one little part of us. He wants us to be whole and full. And if our body is sick, then we, we are not whole and full. And okay, you know, there are illnesses that we get that we may not be healed from. But then spiritually, Jesus wants us to be well so that we can learn to cope and live with those other afflictions in our lives. And that is what this idea of fullness is talks about so Zacchaeus was restored to fullness he was saved so spiritually he was saved he was restored to his community Jesus said you're now a son of Abraham again and he Zacchaeus then went on to save other people restored them because he paid back their money he gave money to the poor and he would have been able to reconcile relationships because when you have uh, broken relationships that impacts on your inner uh, your inner being and your your own inner conflict and so Zacchaeus was able to become whole he was saved salvation came to his house and that was through a simple act of kindness that Jesus showed to him guys I want you to think about when someone has shown you an act of kindness whether it was spontaneous or random um, or whether it was something intentional, like someone choosing to walk alongside you for a tough time in your life, or you maybe were at the tuck shop and you didn't have enough money for something and someone said, I'll buy it for you. Or when you were, you know, sitting at break feeling miserable and maybe tearful and a little bit emotional and someone came up and said to you, I'm going to sit with you, we don't have to talk or anything, let's just be together. Think about one moment where you were shown kindness and the effect the effect that that had on your life um, how did it make you feel what did it lead to for you um, did it lead to some kind of healing um, of brokenness inside of you um, like Jesus act of kindness did for Zacchaeus um, it says in Ephesians 4 verse 32 be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you Guys, we are commanded to be kind. Um, so aside from the fact that it's something that should be coming out of us um, because we are filled with the Spirit and we're living saved lives, we are told be kind to one another. Um, I think people largely underestimate the benefits of kindness. Um, and I can remember, I can remember, so I've asked you guys to remember, I can remember so many 
acts of kindness shown towards me. And I promise you that this kindness was salvation for me in different stages of my life, at different places of wholeness, of brokenness. The kindness people showed to me got me through most terrible times and brought me to a place of wholeness and happiness and joy again. So please don't underestimate what kindness, even if it's a small little act of kindness, can do for people. So kindness, being kind to someone could very well be what they need to know Jesus. Showing kindness could be showing Jesus to someone, okay? And when you do that, you become that person's um, connection or link to salvation. You're, and you cannot underestimate the power of that. If all of this can come about from you being kind, I think we would all just go around being kind all the time. It can be their connection to wholeness, to empowerment, to spiritual fullness, to knowing Jesus as their Lord and Savior who died on the cross for them. Please, guys, do not ever underestimate uh, what it is to be kind. And, you know, sometimes I think because the Holy Spirit nudges us, you know, um, and we get this little feeling in our tummy. Sometimes we don't know what it is, and sometimes we're not entirely sure what God wants of us. So, so part of this lesson is to encourage you guys to start acting on those nudges. You know, if God says to you, reach out to that person, you think, okay, how? Like, what if I give that poor guy a sandwich, and then he, he looks at me and says, but I don't like peanut butter sandwiches. You know, we have all this, like, conflict and then we we question ourselves but if god has told you to do something try to just do it like nike just do it because very often we get involved in the story and then we squash the voice of the holy spirit who's just saying to us just be kind just do it and you know if you do it with the right intentions and with no agenda like i said from that um from those definitions in the beginning with no agenda that means you don't expect anything back Jesus did not expect Zacchaeus to now go wild and give up all his give give all his money his possessions to the poor and then pay back you know fourfold. You do things with no agenda, and that is true kindness. So, um, what else did I want to say to you? There is of course there is of course a benefit for you in all of this because what you sow you reap, and we know that from the Bible. And then there's a few other verses I wanted to share with you. Proverbs 11 verse 17, a man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. And the connection here is that kindness can be in what you do, but it can also be in what you don't do. So when you should, when you should be angry with someone, with a friend who's hurt you, with someone who's lashed out at you, or a friend has gossiped about you, or or, or, you know, a guy has stolen your mom's parking place or, or in the, you know, you just, you are expected to react in a certain way. When you choose not to, that can also be an act of kindness. So, so certainly being cruel will only end up in you being hurt. But, but these, this kindness, whether it is an act or, it, or whether it's withholding something um, and not doing something, so it's a non-act, um, these kindnesses will only benefit you as well and they can't they will not lead to any in any way to you being uh, worse off that's what i'm trying to say Just pull myself towards myself and get my thoughts on track and then jesus says blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy so the more merciful and kind you are to other people the more mercy and kindness you receive um yeah and let's talk about the cost of kindness to you because of course, there isn't definitely an implication there. Um, it may be great. You may um, you may have to go against your um, what all your friends are doing. You may be you, your friends will be saying, "Oh, that person's so horrible. We've got to we've got to stay away from her and treat her badly." Or that bully, he's hurt so many people. He's so ugly to people. We must be ugly back. Um, and you might have to go against all of these voices that are being fed to you, and you might have to seem to be this, this odd one out. And I know teenagers, most people don't want to be the odd one out. Um, I'm over that now. And, 
And the cost to you might be quite great because it might mean that you actually lose friends or that you yourself get talked about because you have shown this kindness to someone who everyone else in society believes doesn't deserve the kindness. You know, what happens if it involves money? Have you seen uh, the adults in your life, you know, your parents or um, other people who, who you look up to as uh, giving selflessly, you know, hospitality, which is a way of showing kindness. That's when you welcome people into your home, you feed them, you say, come stay over here if you're traveling through town, um, being hospitable to people. There's a cost involved because you've got to spend money on food. You, you, you've got to maybe move your kids out of their bedrooms so that um, they can sleep there. You, you will have to share with your brother who irritates you because, because um, your mother wants your, some random friend to come and stay over for the night. Um, so there is a cost involved. Um, it might be small as well. It might be, you know, just holding the door open for someone who's struggling with a whole lot of bags when they're walking through or, you know, helping your mom unpack the car when she gets home from the shopping. So it may be a big cost and it may be a small cost, but there is a cost. And in light of this, I want to remind you about the ultimate kindness, about the kindness that Jesus showed and the cost. Um, and maybe you won't consider the cost to you so much anymore because of what Jesus did for you. Jesus showed mercy when no mercy was due. That's my washing machine in the background, by the way. I kind of forgot that that would now be on camera. It's going to start like really shaking and stuff now. So if you could ignore it, that would help. Then I don't have to record this over. Um, so yeah, Jesus, Jesus went above and beyond in his kindness to us. And I think, um, and this is not a guilt trip. It's not like, well, Jesus did this for you. So you must do this for others. But I think if you can consider that and meditate on the huge sacrifice that was made for your salvation, for you to be whole, um, then maybe when you are uh, nudged to help other people be whole and saved, uh, you won't consider it such a huge cost and such a huge sacrifice. Um, I just want to see if I have, look at my notes, spoken to you about everything I wanted to share with you before I start to wrap, wrap up. Uh, looks like it, hey? Yep. So Zacchaeus was our was our example and it was our story today. And I put together a little bit of a devotion, which I'm going to close with. And then um, one of the teen leaders is going to close in prayer for us. You'll be hearing from Cindy today. Kindness as a fruit of the Spirit. Um, what Jesus showed for his entire ministry was kindness. He healed the sick. He cared for the widow. He fed the hungry. He taught the people. He defended children and he fought injustice. Even when he was hung on a cross to die, he displayed compassionate and merciful kindness. Praying for the very people who had crucified him, he said, Father, forgive them for, for they know not what they do. And he pardoned a repentant thief that was dying on the cross next to him. Jesus was perfectly selfless in everything he did. Kindness flowed from him unceasingly. And it wasn't just random acts of kindness that Jesus did engaging with people as he moved around, um, healing people that he came past that needed healing. Jesus was intentionally kind. His whole life was spent living towards the ultimate kindness. Um, but he looked for opportunities to be kind. He sought out the lost and the lonely. And kindness was his whole lifestyle. It was his M.O. It was how he did things. It was how he did life. He was always kind, even when he was exhausted. Even when he was tired and weary, he was kind without partiality to everyone, whether they deserved it or not. When he was impartial, it meant he showed kindness to everyone. Like in that lesson of love, um, God says, love your neighbor and the Samar the Pharisee says who is your neighbor and Jesus shows him that even a Samaritan who you hate is your neighbor so you have to be impartial with your kindness um, and you have to dish it out whether it's deserved or not Zacchaeus did not deserve the kindness that Jesus showed to him we saw how nasty he would have been how corrupt um, and how wealthy he would have become off the uh, this, the ruin and the poverty of other people 
He didn't deserve it, but Jesus showed him mercy and love and kindness regardless. When Jesus shed his blood on the cross, this sacrifice was the ultimate act of kindness for everyone on earth. So I'm going to encourage you to be Jesus to someone every single day. Shine the light of Christ to a dying world that is in need of a savior. Show the light of Christ to a generation that is so desperately in need of love and grace and kindness. Because you have no idea what your act of kindness can mean for somebody else. It might just mean that they get to know Jesus who showed the ultimate kindness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name and give you thanks for all that you are and all that you do for us. You are so gracious and kind. You love the unlovable and forgive the unforgivable. Please help us to see people the way that you do, Father. You created all of us, and you love all of us. Please grant us the ability to speak kindly and respond gently, so that our words, actions, and reactions will reflect your love and kindness. Change us, lead us, and guide us so that the fruit of your Holy Spirit will grow and manifest more and more in our lives. To your glory and honor. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.